Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Super Fantify. This being a show where we talk about TV shows of the supernatural fantasy and or science fictional genre. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Charmed, as well as the latest episode of American Gods. Like always, if I'm talking about something that you want to listen to, you can always look in the description down below. I include a time when I start talking about each of the respective shows. So, for example, if you want to hear what I say about this week's episode of Charmed, you can skip to what I had to say about this week's episode of American Gods. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is this week's episode of Charn. A lot of interesting things went down in this episode. So in this episode, obviously we see Harry suffering the ramifications, which is so sucky because it's like, oh, he broke the rule because he, him and Charity got together and stuff like that. And, you know, it's like, oh, because he broke that rule, it led to her getting close to the Charmed Ones, which is complete and utter bullshit. Because even Mel calls him out later on and it's like, how are you going to punish Harry? I don't see you guys punishing yourselves because you were just his fault, too, because none of you saw Charity for who she was. But just because they want to find some arbitrary reason to blame Harry, they want to blame this on everyone. It's like, oh, he put the Charmed Ones in danger. He's literally kept them safe the entire time. It's like, you guys messed up. And I love Mel, like, performing magic, trying to get their attention, and they're like, oh, how dare you do that? You know, it's like, you guys are, yes, you guys could be so powerful if you follow orders and stuff like that. Because it's like, we're supposed to be the most powerful witches in the world, and yet we're supposed to take orders from you guys. Because you guys are so caught up in your own bullshit that you're not willing to see the, you know, because, like, how important Harry is to us. And the fact is, he did nothing wrong in this situation. Because, once again, you didn't see Charity for who she was either. So you're just trying to point the finger at somebody. And that does beg the question... Why are they doing that? Like, the thing is, they, they uh, why aren't they taking some culpability? I mean, at least seems like Harry does have some friends because he brings up later on, like, oh, yeah, there's some people in the amongst the group that told him about how Mel stood up for him. So it's not everyone feels like that, but it's probably like a majority vote type of thing of like if majority agrees with taking Harry's powers. Also, it seems brutal when you take someone's powers because like his skin cracking and pieces it pulled apart off of his face as the energy was leaving him. But it also seems because of that state, he's going back into becoming like he's basically going back to who he is supposed to be timeline wise, essentially, because his life was frozen when he died and became a, you know, came back as a white lighter. And without that, the fact is that he's kind of aging as a human and stuff like that. Did that ever come up in the original series? The whole like, I, I feel like I vaguely remember Leo le losing his powers. I know Cole left, lost his powers for a while as a demon, but I can't remember if Leo ever lost his powers, I want to say he did. I feel like I remember that, but I just, I don't remember exactly. But nevertheless, obviously it didn't have the same ramifications if I remember correctly. So that's kind of sucky. So Harry's literally sitting there aging. It's kind of sad because all around, like, it's kind of sucky because it's like, this is happening with Harry. Still no word from Galvin. Parker's going through a situation like they have, they're like, they're worried on all three different levels at three different points. And it's just, it's sad that things have kind of come down to this. Mel even goes to Jada for help. It's like, yo, the Sarkana, yeah, the Sarkana's all about taking control. You know, the elders are thinking in the box. You're going to blow up the box. They're basically going to be thinking outside of it. So like, yeah, let's help Harry. It's like, yeah, oh, I feel bad for him. He's your friend and everything. It's like, we'll help him. It's like, well, we can't, we're not going to help some patsy to the elders and like mel's like don't talk about him like that he's our friend it's like the fact of the matter is it's not his fault he was duped by the elders and their ways like to be fair i mean to be fair they brought him back they gave him life they gave him purpose as a white lighter so why would he ever question it he's like okay they had their ways he might not 100 percent agree with him but the fact of the matter is things are the way they are for a particular reason but for Jada, it's like everything that's going on with Fiona is too important to let this all get messed up in a way. Even her being like, my feelings for you, Mel, this task is too important. You're part of just certain kind of, you shouldn't understand it. She's like, I thought I understood. I thought I knew who we were, but it turns out not to be the case. Even Fiona being like, honestly, you did the right thing. Uh, someone that's going to lay down with my sister deserves whatever happens to him. It's like, Jesus, Fiona. What the hell? Just because he slept with your sister, you're you're going to be like, oh, he's not worth saving and stuff like that? Jesus, I know you hate your sister, but you're going to lash out at Harry for that? Harry, who was once your own white lighter, but maybe that's what, maybe it's because on some level, Fiona actually had feelings for him, and it's like, you chose my sister over me. My sister always got everything. She thought she was the better sister. A lot of people treated her like she was the better sister. I got locked up in Tartarus. She became an elder, which that makes her hate you know, Charity probably even more because it's like you became the pe same people who locked me up. Depends on the timeline of when that happened. I don't 
I don't know if they expressly brought that up even last episode of how that timeline worked, whether she was already an elder by the time she got locked up. I assumed it was before Charity became an elder, but nevertheless. And it's like, you know, like I said, I guess she must feel like Harry betrayed her in some shape or form, but the fact that she's not willing to help. But then later on, she's over here in a conversation, and then she shows up, and I'm like, because I was wondering, I was like, okay, so is she starting to feel this way because it's like, oh, like, you know, I see how Harry is important to everyone, and then I start going, no. She wants the charm because she knows, like, hey, if I say Harry, the charm one's going to be in my favor. Turns out that outright becomes the thing later on because also she tries to get inside of Harry's head, but because he's not like a white lighter anymore, she can't get what she wants. I also love that she slapped him, and then when like time ended up unfreezing later on, he starts touching his cheek because it finally hit him uh, what had happened. But it kind of shows you Fiona isn't, at the very least, maybe at one point in time, Fiona was an innocent person, but being locked up in Tartarus all that time. Uh, she was, wasn't she in there for like 10 years or something like that? So for, or whatever the case may be. So for her, it's a situation of like probably being tortured like that. Cause there's no telling what the scorpion showed her in those 10 years, you know, enough to probably piss her off. You know, she's very jaded. Like she might make it seem like, cause I think the Sarkhan is under the impression of like, oh yeah, we're going to change everything. Magic's going to run wild. We're going to, we're going to shake things up. But to be fair, I think at the end of the day, Fiona just wants revenge. That's all she cares about. She had, doesn't have this good-natured reason for doing all that she's doing. I think it's pure, unadulterated revenge, and she's just fueled by anger. She's so angry at everything and everyone, whether, you know, so... I don't know. It's go definitely going to be interesting to see where that goes, because it all ties into uh, the main enemy of this uh, episode, Viralis. Uh, besides, side note, isn't that the actor who plays Alex on Roswell? That That's crazy if that is. I'm pretty sure that is, but I could be wrong. But uh, essentially, he's a demon that basically kills women every, 10 women every 10 years so he can suck up their uh, virility uh, and live on. Basically, the way I love the way Mel put it, it was kind of lightweight. So they're basically like he uses them as like demonic Viagra, and it's like ugh. he ends up getting Maggie. And it's kind of interesting because it's kind and actually kind of sad because like Maggie, what he was able to kind of promise Maggie to kind of seduce her was you know a love that would never die because she's already going through that. Like the man she loves, Parker, is dying. A family member she cares about is dying, and that's Harry. And for her, it's like, oh, Varillas will give me a love that will never die. And it's it's kind of sad that that, you know, I mean, it kind of makes sense to consider who Maggie is. I mean, the empath also, like, being just naturally the person with their heart on their sleeve, you know? And it's just, it's kind of sad that things have kind of come down to that. I also love Harry helping out, too. I love him being like, oh, yeah, I fuck. She's like... Mel's like, hey, Harry, can you orb again? He's like, no, I just happened to follow you because I thought you guys might be in trouble. So, but, you know, so, you know, I followed you like any ordinary person would. He's like, well, an ordinary stalker. But then I thought you guys were just getting tea, so I took a nap. <laughs> just Harry just being so old, just like, oh. It's like, he's like, no, I don't want to go. I'll just get in your way. He's like, fine, I'll drive. And they're walking up the stairs. So like, oh, sorry. And they go back down and grab him. He's like, yep, yeah, my old bones. I love it. Uh. Because I love him saying basically like, oh, aging, it just, it sucks so much. Because uh, especially because it's happening all at once for him, so that's really shitty. Uh, but that Varilla situation was interesting in many different regards. For one, how Macy ended up beating him, taking the knife and throwing it at I love that that was the final blow to his junk. Maybe they had said so earlier if it had to be a nut, like a, you know, a groin, uh, hit but whether or not it's just like you saw him crumble to his knees as he before he died i was like oh that's one super sucky way to die dude to be very kind of a piece of shit and like you know sacrificing ladies basically making them surrender and sacrificing themselves for you so you can live on so it's like yeah but still it you know, you kind of, get, kind of cross your legs a little bit and go, ooh, that sucks. Uh, but the really interesting thing about that, too, is how this ties into Nico. And now, like, oh, also Mel met Nico's fiance Greta. That's not awkward. But then it turns into a whole conversation of Nico being like, oh, I could have sworn I saw Scarlet levitating. What? No. Must be crazy. It's like, yeah, but, you know, at the same time, it's like, Oh, when Nico shows up later, she ends up being there at this crime scene, and it's like, oh, wow, the guy got away again. It's like, huh, more and more crazy stuff is happening around you, Mel. And she's like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Nico's definitely going to figure that out because, you know, like I said, just more and more suspicious stuff. It's kind of interesting. You went through so much trouble to make sure that she didn't remember you so you could keep her safe, yet Nico still found her way 
back into your life. It's almost kind of like Destiny's trying to put you two together in that regard. It's almost like, no, you're meant to be together in some shape or form. And I think when it's all said and done, I th well, I mean, because at first I was like, maybe Nico will remember, but it's like, she can't possibly remember. They literally reverse time. So there's nothing to remember. I mean, that timeline, it's not like that's locked away in her mind. It's like she, the entire world changed and the only people that remember that is obviously Harry, Mel, uh, Maggie and Macy so I'm curious to see what that ends up being but like I think eventually Nico's going to get deeper and deeper into this and find out about magic being real and then it goes to the point like I mean because what you know it's going to turn into a complicated thing of being like yeah so you and me we had a history we actually dated but then like I reversed time and made it so the past two years of our relationship didn't happen and now you're engaged to someone else and that's a whole complicated can of worms because you can tell like because even Maggie was like oh like why the fact you're trying to pretend like you're not excited to see uh Nico and it's like no 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 I'm just doing because she seems like she needs something it's like then why are you thinking about how soft her lips are she's like stop and getting all embarrassed and stuff it's like yeah obviously I mean to be fair it's like once again it's like and I think that's kind of sad too because it also shows like her relationship compared to Jada it's, it's like the fact is even with everything happening with Jada there's still I mean to be fair you don't forget that love you know like what happened what she had with Nico was something special so of course it's going to be hard like those type of relationships once again it still hasn't even been that long since you went and erased your entire relationship relationship you know so that's kind of a heavy thing all on its own so that's why like it's going to be hard to compare like your relationship with the whole situation with nico but still so that's just an interesting can of worms especially considering where her and jada currently stand also a side note kind of since i'm talking about sarkana it also shows you that fiona doesn't give a damn about this arcana it's like well what about the sarkana i don't care like for her it's like once again it's like her goals aren't aligned with theirs but they're so focused on what they want they think like oh no she's got her best intentions in mind like maybe Fiona who Fiona was before going to Tartars maybe not this Fiona this Fiona is so consumed by revenge that's all she sees um, kind of along the same lines kind of going back to the uh, Varilla situation is you know obviously getting the blood for Parker and that was interesting because obviously his mom is like daughter Julia being like you have to um administer the blood it's kind of what happened before and parker nearly you know killed her last time uh this happened is actually getting a blood transfusion from alistair back when he was sick is actually what activated his demon side and we see it in this episode what she was talking about we saw parker basically in his demon form uh which like because even when he used his powers before he always maintained a human form but i guess this is kind of what happens when his like demon side is kind of set into overdrive and stuff like that at the end of the day you're still curious like what alistair's really up to i mean because the fact is that obviously julia's you know uh way of handling this will work but it will undo all the work they did of trying to make parker more and more human it's just gonna like strengthen his demon side and it might make it so that when it's all said and done like her work might not work she's saying it should work but when the time comes it might not work on you know parker and make him you know weaken it down because obviously alistair has his whole plan for this what exactly i don't know this still all circles back to the um source of all evil which i'm curious how this ties into potentially what's going on with um fiona like i said she even admitted like oh yeah the charm was gonna owe me one so she's gonna save harry and he apologizes and she apologizes too and she restores his power uh by going to the vortex but when it's all said and done, she's trying to rip something out of his head. I guess it's like the elders have like this cosmic roadmap to everything. Maybe as a white lighter, he knows all there is to know about the elders. And so that information is like Fiona's trying to get to it so she can kill all the elders because they're the ones that put her in the situation. Once again, full-blown revenge. But I guess it's so heavily protected because she can't get access to it. Maybe it's not even just that. Maybe it's something beyond. Because it's interesting because for her, it's like that's what sucking up all this power like that she's been trying to get. Maybe there's an even greater power that she's aiming for with all of this. I have no idea. It's going to be interesting because if that ends up being the case, the elders are going to be wanting the charm one's help, but it's like, oh yeah, like we're kind of under your thumb and stuff like that because it's like, because at the same time, it's so interesting because it's like, we don't have a direct line to the elders. The elders kind of call us whenever they want, but we can't get in contact when we want to get in contact with them because they're like, they've got their own rules set in motion and stuff like that. It's like, the last thing you want is to have the charmed ones as enemies, but I think for them, it's like, yeah, you're powerful witches, but you can't match our power. It's like, but the fact is, Harry kind of shows in this episode because they were like, wait, we can literally just get rid of a demon's like, 
blocker on our tracking, and it's like, yeah, you guys don't know just how much you're capable of. And that's the thing. No one knows just how powerful the Charmed Ones are. I think even the Elders underestimate how strong they are. Maybe even Fiona. I mean, Fiona kind of gets it a little bit because that's why she's trying to get a favor from them because it's like, oh, if I can get them on my side, I guess it's leading to the whole... Harry thing. So it's probably going to be a thing of like she's going to keep Harry and try and get the information out of his head because she can't get it otherwise. At first she felt like she couldn't get it I guess because the magic had been taken from him. At first I was thinking maybe it has something to do with male freeze and time or maybe it's a combination of two. But ultimately it's like when his powers are restored she tries to do it. She can pull it out mostly but then like it drags itself back in. So And it seems like it hurts Harry because I guess like the more force that's put on him on the outside the more force and pressure it puts on his head and his mind so it's kind of sad because I'm sure it seems like Fiona's probably going to be torturing the information out of him now that's going to be a true test to see how the Sarkana including Jada feels about this like when they see potential like whoa you're doing this to Harry like I mean I get it he's a white lighter and stuff like that but should you really be doing it because she's like you don't realize how important Harry is now is it just because it's Harry or would any white lighter so uh, you know do or you know so if that is the case maybe Fiona's choosing him because it's like well you're the one white lighter I know where you are and you also owe me a favor so I can use this to my advantage but also because it's Harry and she wants to punish him you know so her complicated situation with her sister so it's definitely going to be interesting to see where all this takes us going forward and you know Nico and Mel uh, Galvin, because once again, we have not gotten back to that in such a long time. It's going to be interesting. I'm wondering, is there ever going to be a point of, you know, getting rid of, because like that evil sight that uh, Macy has, I hope she gets to keep that when it's all said and done. Probably not the moment they can get rid of her demon side. That'll probably be it. I'm curious, is that going to tie into Parker's story at all? Because I didn't even think about that till now. It's like, well, Macy is part demon too, so they might set her up to potentially become the new host for the um, source of all evil. I mean, you would assume Parker because Parker is half human, half demon, but maybe Macy falls under that category too because of the demon blood in her. We'll have to wait and see. But then, you know, the whole Parker situation and if Maggie will ever see him like that. Maybe Julia, will, you know, Dr. Julia would do a good enough job to be like, I can handle this long enough to kind of keep you away from ever seeing him like that. Because, you know, it's got to break her heart to see her, her son looking like that, you know, in that demon form like that. Then, like I said, Mel and Jada slash Nico, this whole thing with Fiona. Obviously, let's not forget about Alistair kicking it with Charity. Because, once again, they're talking about, oh, this and that. Charity should be in Tartarus, and you're going to get punished. It's like, Charity's not even in Tartarus. So, there's another fail against you. That had nothing to do with Harry. That was a failure on your part. Even if Alistair stepped in, it's like, and the fact is, you don't even know that she's not in Tartarus. So, that speaks volumes in itself. I mean, to be fair, you're literally... It's, it's just a whole complicated can of worms. I'm so interested to see what the next episode has in store for us with all of this. And now moving on to this week's episode of American Gods. A lot of interesting things went down in this episode. First and foremost, you have uh, Shadow having sex with a cat lady. That was interesting. Uh, the moment she just, because you heard like purring or meowing before she popped up. And then, like, obviously, like, I think her eyes, like, I cut, I kind of didn't focus too much on, but it did seem like her eyes were a little different, like, they were cat-like eyes. Plus, the whole scratching kind of solidified it, too. But I love, like, Shadow being like, no, 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 my, my wife will kill you. It's like, that's true, especially when he's seen what she's capable of doing. But then, like, she was saying, like, no, uh, sh not me. Now, initially, I interpret that as, like, oh, because you're a cat, the whole nine lives situation, so there's that. But then another part of me was, like, or she's saying, like, oh, no, she won't kill me. If she was killing one, she'd most likely kill you for this situation. So that was interesting um, in that regard. I guess because the whole point is kind of, I guess that's supposed to be Wednesday kind of set that up potentially to be like, hey, you had a good time, licked your wounds and everything, you feel good. Uh, got some extra wounds along the way. It makes you wonder, like, the fact is they made such a point to include those scratches. Obviously, it's to make him see that, like, oh, everything that happened in what was potentially a dream was real. But also, maybe it's something that's going to come up later on with Laura's, like, where the hell did you get these scratches from type of thing? I don't know. It is kind of interesting, uh, like, Wednesday is still trying to keep them separated. Because, like, Shadow is like, do you know where Laura is? Like, and Ibis wanted to say something, but, you know, you had... Wednesday be like, don't say anything. Because once again, he needs Shadow as isolated as possible. That's why he pushed Laura to do everything she did last episode. Just so that 
she would be under, you know, out of the way, essentially. So that that in itself is just a very interesting situation. And then they go, basically, they're going to go get money. And I love, like, Wednesday telling that story the way he did it. Basically, money is the greatest story ever told because this is just a piece of paper. Yet you guys have told your story over and over and over again over the generations to be like, this is worth something. It has a value. When in actuality, it is just a piece of paper. It's just it's funny when you actually break it down and think of it like that. And so, and I also love that money is essentially kind of like a god, essentially, because it's like, yo, they literally have to go to money for help. And I also love the situation of, like, obviously those girls scouts are kind of like i guess like the hey like you once you have credit and stuff like that you get past us they're kind of like i guess like the receptionist in a certain way and then you can get access to money uh well i guess you can think of them as the bank tellers i guess that's what that really comes down to and then like money is the actual bank itself it's just an interesting situation but i love it it's like oh odin you're on the list uh shadow uh no you're not on the list denied it's like wait what yeah, because apparently he doesn't have any credit, like, identification and stuff like that stuff you would need to get money out of the bank. And even Odin's like, what the hell? What do you mean you don't have any credit or anything? Like, the fact of the matter is, were you, like, one of those weirdos who are off the grid or something like that? And he's like, no. Laura basically handled all that stuff, and he never saw fit to it. It's just like, oh, that's really interesting, and it's kind of screwing Odin over. But what I really love is that conversation between him, because Odin's like, all right, you want to know why I really picked you? Because you have no value, whether it be in this world or next. No one living or dead, for all that I, you know, I'm aware of, cares whether you live or die, which is not the case, because we know that Laura cares whether he lives or dies. So that's already in itself completing all the BS, but then like, Shadow's like, oh, wow. So that's how it really is, and he's like, yep. But then Shadow's like... I know you're lying because the fact is I do have some value to you. What that value is, why I'm so important to you, I don't know. Why the fact is that you're hiding that fact from me, I don't know. But the fact is I am important to you. And you almost see Mr. Mr. Wizard getting a little annoyed that Shadow, because Shadow knows it's like, no, like you want to pretend like, because by pretending like I have no value, you're, tr you're trying to keep me in your pocket. Like a lot of what he said was true. The fact that you have no one, but to be fair, that's because he orchestrated her. Like, that shows how important you are, because he literally went out of his way to construct it so that you had no one in your life. So that's why I'm kind of like, yeah. It makes you wonder, has he always had his eye on Shadow, like, even way back then? Like I said, maybe it's just like, maybe it's the thing of, he did meet Wednesday. It didn't sound like... Ian McShane, the person he was talking to that showed him the coin trick, but maybe there's some connection there. Maybe he sent someone, or maybe this someone passed the message on to Wednesday of like, oh, this kid's something special. I don't know. Like I said before, I thought it might have been his dad, but like I said, that's a conversation that still hasn't really been had about like what that whole deal is. The fact is they're hiding that. His mom didn't want to talk about it, so we'll see. Um, I also love the situation with Mama G, too. The fact is, it's like, wait, don't didn't you work in like in like Wisconsin or something like that and it's like oh apparently she works at all like the motel places like that all over the place like her and her followers own like half of them in America and I love her message to Shadow's like you know he's going to be the death of you right and once they turned around he's like hey, what, did she, what did she just say because <laughs> uh, he was so focused on his own goal um, but that in itself is interesting I'll kind of get back to that later on but what I also thought was kind of fascinating is the other side of this episode everything with Bill Quist because it seems like hey she's chosen a side and it seems to be Wednesday's side for her it's like oh it's like um Zariah's death is kind of what pushed her but it's like you're still playing defenses even Nancy's like hmm the fact is you keep flipping flopping across the battlefield like how are we supposed to know where your allegiances are like the fact is you know I don't know man I still don't trust her 100% because of, like, the conversation Mr. World had with her. I think she's chosen a side, and I think she's still on Mr. World's side playing Wednesday. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, to be fair, Wednesday's on the more favorable side of things because I even love it later on being, like, because Mr. World, you know, Wednesday's like, I'm going to win this war because more people like me. But Mr. World's like, I prefer to be feared, and he's feared by a lot. So I assume, you know, that... Fear over Miss of Mr. World would probably outrank like any like that Bill Quist might have for Wednesday that she might side with him in that regard. Because I think you know Bill Quist can kind of understand because she's an older god that got kind of you know forgotten. You know Wednesday's all about you know all rallying up those who felt forgotten, and it's so interesting to kind of hear the conversations between Bill Quist. Uh, 
Mr. Ebus and Nancy. Especially because we kind of finally found out what Ebus' whole situation is. Like, basically, we know he's recording a lot of history and stuff like that. That's because he's the Toth. It's basically like this sacred book that basically, if you read it, if anyone just reads it, it causes pain and suffering to him. But to the person who's writing it, hey, you get the benefit of kind of getting a bird's eye view of the world in essentially because we saw that before like how he has access to the knowledge he does because he sees the stories because he's basically recording it and that's such an interesting situation to be in. i mean i knew he was recording history and stuff like that but now we kind of got a little more context to it as well but it was kind of interesting hearing nancy kind of speak up like he did i mean obviously we heard bits of this in season one but we've really seen nancy lay it down in this season for him it's just kind of like the fucked up nature of everything that you know just basically about how the system works and stuff like that. How like every 30 seconds there's he being a child uh, snatched up. That slavery got a rebrand like the fucking alt-right. I was like, geez, that's an interesting uh, statement. But essentially it was like basically how it was like life, you know, to, because of your skin color can like pipeline you from school to prison faster than a cut could bleed. Now that was an interesting uh, analogy. And then also, but it can also pipeline you from school to the NFL where you can't even take a fucking knee. And I was like, oh, that's obviously very topical in that regard. But it's so interesting because obviously you see Nancy sample because even for him, it's like, even look at this war situation. That's why he's so pissed because he feels like, because that rage about just the way this situation plays out in this country and just kind of, in particular, I think this country, not just necessarily the world. It's there in the world, but obviously it's a much bigger thing in this country. But for him, it's like... The fact is, even with this war, it's like, oh, Wednesday's getting all pissed because it was a white lady that got killed. But Chernobyl's hammer wouldn't be swinging if it was anyone else. Only because, you know, so for him, it almost seems like, and this is, could be me misinterpreting it, but the way things are kind of building up, it almost feels like Nancy's building his own. Like, obviously, Nancy has his reasons for getting into this fight, and it seems like it's separate from Wednesday's. And I think Wednesday's kind of fine with him doing his own thing, whatever, as long as you're fighting by my side. But part of me wonders is when it's all said and done, is. Nancy starting his own side of things. Obviously, him and Bill Quist, that's a thing happening. Every king needs a queen. In fact, he's referring to himself like that. Like, I mean, you know, you could just be like, oh, you know, looking at it as kind of a situation of like, we're looking out for our people type of situation. So we'll be the king and queen of doing that. We'll work with Wednesday doing his thing, sure, but we'll be the king and queen looking out for our people type of thing. Or is that him saying, like, nah, fuck Wednesday, we doing our own thing, even more so to the point, like, there's a third party in all of this. I think they're still siding with Wednesday. It's it's really hard to say, like, 100%. It's also interesting, the whole Bill Quist situation, too. Like, it seems like her befriending uh, that Lady Ruby, who's at the funeral home. Part of me wonders, is she supposed to be kind of like what Shadow is to Odin, you know? Just because, I don't know. It just seems like an interesting thing that's kind of being set up. Like, the fact is, it's almost like she's found her... Her, like follower to a certain extent someone that like you know will believe in her you know because like it, they had this whole interesting conversation earlier too about how uh Benitha about how that story was basically she got tired of like God's God getting all the credit for the stuff that humans did you got like a non she was a non-believer that was kind of like nah humans made this shit happen because of like our stubbornness and unwillingness to give up and stuff like that and so that basically what was it your truth shouldn't be hidden in a god to the point like basically a girl should hide herself within a god so she isn't able to speak her own or, or even hear her own truth but it's kind of interesting because then, like, Nancy quoted Maya Angelou was basically, like, a woman hiding herself in God leaves a man to find God to find her. So, it, like I said, it's just an interesting thing. Obviously, differences of perspective and stuff like that. But getting back to what I was saying earlier was because, like, Bill Quest had talked about the fact is of, like, Jesus' whole situation of, like, oh, he didn't die for your sins. He died because he challenged, basically, the people in power, that Jesus was a rebel. And now look at this situation. It's like so many people worship him. And she's almost, like, envious because she's almost like he's, he has it figured out that this is how you really get worshipped. You know, and I think, like I said, I think that's what she might be doing with Ruby. The question that might be, like, what's going on with Shadow. Like I said, I still feel like it's like some God level stuff, like he might be a demigod or something like that. Because it's so interesting because we still don't 100% know how gods necessarily work in this world of like, 
who gave birth to the gods that they give birth to themselves like how that situation came to be because you know because maybe shadow isn't even like a demigod maybe he is just a full-blown god type of situation who knows you know if that ends up being the case of why he's so important and all this nevertheless because it's interesting because we had that whole story at the beginning about that uh, kid, uh, his dad trying to get him to play piano, but he was so focused on games and stuff like that. And then it became a situation that he cre composed this amazing music, but it turned out it wasn't him. He actually programmed a computer to do it. And the dad was a little disheartened because it was like, oh, like, because for him, it's like a computer can't really capture the essence, the heart that the human heart can. You know, because for him, it was like that was his way to pray, like, you know, box music of being like, yeah, this was his way of grieving for the children he had lost. But it's such high notes kind of representing kind of like the the hope that was there, you know, so it was just kind of an interesting thing, kind of like the son being so wrapped up in tech and then like the dad not really being like that. He liked things kind of because for him, it's just like it seemed artificial to just make this sound because like, yeah, it's pretty and stuff like that, but it doesn't have the heart. And he, it seemed like he wanted his son to kind of steer away from that. He didn't want his son being sucked up into it, but it seems like his son ends up building a tech empire. But as dad funeral, dad's funeral, we see the tech kid. So I guess like the tech kid, you know, he, he you know, he's a God. It's that whole like chicken or egg situation of like, oh, when that kid created that, first like program like that was that what ended up birthing the tech god just because it's like hey like i knew god was born on that day just because of how much he believed in tech and it birthed a god like that or oh, was a tech kid already a thing but this you know uh tech dude kid like the tech kid the tech god in particular like got stronger because this kid believed so much in it and it gave him more strength and power and position cut to present day where things aren't that good it led to an interesting conversation between him and media basically media is like were you there when the old media died and he was like she didn't die she transformed into you it was almost like this existential thing of like oh he's like because new media is like i feel her a little bit inside of me and it's like when i become a new person do you think that new person is going to feel me and then the next person is going to feel all of us i was like that's such an existential question to be asking for a god and you had the whole situation of like do you know what the difference is between an animal and a human? Humans know about their mortality. They know that one day they're going to die. And they pray to gods to push that as far away as possible. Animals are ignorant. They don't think about death like that. And like new me was like, what was your point? It's like, you're not human or an animal. You're a god. So stop thinking. I think so. Stop thinking so linearly. Like, because you're thinking almost like a human. It's like, you're not human. You're a god. Think like a god. Like, think you're above that mortality shit, I think. It's kind of what he was kind of getting at. But I love Mr. World being super pissed to the point that he's literally digging into the tech kid's eyes. I was like, jeez. So the tech kid goes to visit his friend. I love that uh, new media being an asshole, being like, who's afraid of the big bad world? You are. Better come through, essentially. And he's just like, I hate you so much. But he goes to meet his friend and everything. And it's like, hey, like, we're going to, we're going to basically, Argus was obsolete. The fact is, with the way tech has been set up and everything, I can be everywhere. We can get eyes everywhere. And it's like, show me. But the tech kid didn't really show him and the world's like do it do what he says oh you won't do it fine then i will and media shows up new media shows up and captivates him and so for the tech kid it's like i was your only friend and i guess on some level like i said because i guess that guy was like the foundation of the tech kid in the sense of like without him like every all that belief and like he had in him kind of crumbles and stuff like that because it showed that he was obsolete because i mean new media literally brought it up last episode being like isn't it kind of interesting because we're kind of in the same lane but he tried to like solidify his position but like no 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 like we're different enough that i should be able to stick around but it's like no new media ended up captivating the dude and so it shows mr world's like i don't need you anymore and a tech kid tries to run and ends up getting as mr world puts it retired now that was interesting. That's the first time we've outright seen that. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean he got killed. It just seems like he just got locked away. So might not be seeing any more of him. We'll be seeing a lot more of new media. So that's definitely going to be interesting. But I love Mr. World, you know. For him, it's like, because once again, the old school versus the new school, it's like, oh, you're up here worrying about money and stuff like that. The fact of the matter is it's not about fives and tens anymore. Mr. World's like, it's about 
zeros and ones essentially being like basically the cryptocurrency in a sense of just like everything being digitized that you know it's like about you know basically you can kind of swoop in and scoop everything up just because there's all these different you know banks and stuff like that because everything's kind of electronic now and stuff like that that there's no actual value in a sense so it almost makes everything kind of almost endless in certain regards because things aren't necessarily physical even though you have Mr. World being I mean Mr. Wednesday being so old school that it's like oh let's get something physical money wise it's just it was just kind of an interesting aspect to it and I love money being like yeah I'd love to help you out but the fact of the matter is I'm not investing in something emotionally the fact is he wants something that's a guarantee and the fact of the matter is there's risk involved in this situation so he left a tip and that's all that Wednesday ended up walking away from this situation with but uh like I said, it was just kind of an interesting episode with everything kind of being compiled upon itself and just everything being in it, what it is. Like I said, it seems like, you know, like I said, Nancy's doing his thing because it seems like, you know, Billquist as well as Mr. Ebus, because even Ebus was like, no, nah, I'm sticking out of this because for him, it's like he remembers the names of all those that were taken, lost and all that. And so for him, it's like that's his part to play in this because he wants no part of this war he chose peace because even Nancy's like you old as hell too so why are you choosing a side in this war for him it's like yeah I just want to go down a path of peace because that's not where I'm supposed to be that's not the path I plan to walk down but you know after Nancy's speech it seems like you know it might have changed it definitely changed Bill Quist's mind it made her kind of look at things a little differently because it seemed like before, it seemed like Bill Quist might be kind of so consumed by herself. I mean, it seems like that is her thing. It's just like, look at me, look at me. But now it seems like this might be her kind of branching out potentially and being like, hey, the fact is I'm starting to care about other people. And, you know, once again, that might feed into like her whole thing of like trying to do her own Jesus thing of like, oh, yeah, like being the rebel. And then, you know, people following you. And then like, you know, like maybe that, like I said, that's what she's trying to spark with Ruby and then gain a bigger following from it like i said that might be what wednesday's up to maybe not like i said it's a very interesting episode i'm very curious to see what the next episode has in store for us with all of this going forward but really that's all i want to talk about to the next time we meet be happy be safe love like said fools and enjoy it good day and goodbye